Last week on the show, we talked about how to fix high pH soil. This week, we're going to talk about low pH soil. So first of all, to identify this issue, you need a soil test. You're going to look at two things. You're going to look at the soil pH, but we also want you to take a look at what is your base saturation hydrogen number. The reason why you look at that is the only reason a soil has hydrogen is the pH is below 7. The higher that base saturation hydrogen number, the lower your pH, and that should correlate together with that soil pH number being low on your soil test. Now, in some parts of the world, soils are naturally low in pH. Before they've ever been farmed, the first soil test you ever pulled out on virgin ground said, well, hey, our pH is really, really low. I was in an area in Brazil where the pH was often in the fours before they were even farming that ground. So it's not like farming practices cause pH to be low in all cases. However, in some soils, farming practices are causing soils to be low in pH because I talk to farmers that say, well, every few years, I've got to put a solution out there for low pH soil again, even if I fix it, I don't have anything long term. So we want to address that issue as well. One of the things that can cause soil pH to go down is when you have excess nitrogen out there. So let's just say that your crop can't use all the nitrogen that you've applied, or for that matter, your soil has so much organic matter and it produces a lot of its own nitrogen, and then that nitrogen is in excess too. This can happen even in a year where you raise zero crop. If you have nothing out there and your soil's producing a bunch of nitrogen, well, where's that nitrogen going? When you have rainfall, and especially excess rainfall, what will happen is a lot of that nitrogen will convert over to nitrate. Then a lot of that will convert to nitrogen acid and it will strip out calcium out of your soil. When it does that, obviously pH is going down. So what is the solution to that? Well, of course you would add more calcium to the soil and the most common way to do that is by putting out lime, which is calcium carbonate. Now with lime, as you're putting that out on soil, that calcium carbonate is going to combine with your excess hydrogen in the soil to produce water, carbon dioxide, and free calcium. With the calcium carbonate you get for your soil, you basically have two choices. Calcitic lime, which is high in calcium, and dolomitic lime, which is high in magnesium. Still got a lot of calcium, but it's much higher in magnesium. In our soils, we naturally have lots of magnesium, so I don't want any more. I don't want the dolomitic lime. What I want is calcitic lime. But if you're also short on magnesium, then get that dolomitic product. Now, the big thing with any of these limes is you want a very small particle size. If you've got a small particle size, I equate it to just like ice. If you're gonna cool a drink down, do you put one ice cube in? Or would you expect more cooling if you used crushed ice? Well, the crushed ice cools faster because you have more surface area to make change. It's the same thing with lime. So there's going to be a big difference in lime sources. So you want to make sure you have them tested to see what the particle size is to know how quickly you're going to make a change in your soil. And then you need to take a look at what's the cost. So what we usually suggest is, let's say you've got two different sources of lime, send them both into a lab, tell the lab, hey, this one costs X, this one costs Y, which one would be a better value for me? And they should be able to tell you. All right, Brian, the other question we get a lot is about tillage. Do I till in the lime? And if so, how deeply do I till? And what if I'm in a no-till situation? Can I still make the change? Absolutely, it will work in no-till. It's just going to take more time. When you till it in, the change is going to occur more quickly. So don't get too worried about it if you're in no-till. But I would say this, if you are in no-till, maybe you want to put on less and do it over a longer period of time. With tillage, you can stir a lot of that lime in and get that all worked in. So you could run with a little bit higher rate. The problem with going with too high a rate, let's say I'm in no-till or even conventional till, if you go too high a rate, you can tie up some nutrients in the short term. So you got to be a little bit careful with what you do. Our standard recommendation is 2,400 pounds of actual calcium, not lime, but actual actual calcium. So look at your percentage on your lime test. And oh, speaking of tests, I would also test your lime for other nutrients because you might get some other things out of your lime. For example, our lime that we get is water treatment lime. So we'll get some free sulfur. We'll get some free phosphorus, maybe even some free zinc and other micronutrients. So it's important to understand what all is in your lime. The other question, Brian, is what time of year should we get lime out? Typically, we're seeing a lot of lime applied right after harvest. You've got more time for it to be out on the soil to impact that change. You could do lime applications in the spring. That would be okay, too. It's just that to impact that year's crop, well, it's probably not going to happen. It's probably going to start kicking in later in the season once you get some moisture to move it down through the soil profile. 
one last question that I commonly get is, how about on rented ground? What do I do for rented ground? Well, first of all, I would talk to the landlord and say, look, we've got this pH. Lime is a long-term investment, so will you help me? Will you give me a long-term lease or will you pay for part of the lime? Otherwise, what we do have some people doing is banding small rates of very available lime and just going that way. Now, I don't love that because lime to me is a soil amendment. I want to fix all the soil so I have better microbial activity. I have better overall growth in the soil. But if you have to band it because you're on a cash rent and this is your last year having that ground, well, I can understand that. One last thing is where do you want your soil pH to be? For me, if I could pick one soil pH across my farm raising corn and soybeans, I like 6.3. But if you're at a high pH and you say, wow, I'm at an eight now, I have to get all the way down to 6.3, we'd at least like to get down to a 6.8. And if you're coming up from the bottom and you say, man, I got pHs in the low fives, I'd like to at least get up to that 6.2 or 6.3 range. If you're somewhere in that 6.3 to 6.8, that seems to be where the best nutrient availability is. All right, but that all depends on the crop you're raising. We talked about this last week too. There are certain crops that like low pH, certain crops that like high pH. The reason why we were talking about lime today is if you want to raise the pH of your soil, you absolutely can do it with lime. Well, I wish that lime would control our Weed of the Week, Brian, because that would make life so much easier. We'll show you what will stop our Weed of the Week coming up next.